Have you ever wondered, would you be a bit happier if you're a bit more wealthy? Or maybe if you're a bit more attractive? Or maybe you've wondered, why isn't your relationship giving you the same satisfaction as it used to? Or maybe you're wondering, why is that gadget that you bought three months ago still sitting on your closet floor and it didn't give you that great happiness that you really expected from it? Well, these are all aspects of the science of happiness, a discipline that combines neurobiology, psychology, communication, and others to answer these questions that are really pressing for us and for happiness in total. So without further ado, let's start with the hypothetical situation. Let's say that um, you have two choices. The first choice is that you win $50 million in the lottery right now. Pretty great choice, kind of hard to turn down, but you still have a second option. The second option is that you get an accident and you become paraplegic. So to become happier, which one would you choose? Seems pretty obvious, right? And you're right, because the people who chose to win the lottery or did win the lottery, they became happier. Whereas the people who got into an accident and became paraplegic, their happiness fell from their baseline happiness. But in this study entitled Lottery Winners and Accident Victims, we found something even more interesting. That just one year later, both of their happinesses returned back down to their baseline. People who were in a car accident returned back to how they were before. And people who just won a lottery, just one year later, it didn't mean as much to them. So what does this mean about the human condition? Well, it means that we're incredibly resilient. No matter what bad happens to us, we eventually bounce back from it. But on the opposite side, if you win the lottery or have something really good happen to you, hedonic adaptation kicks in and you adapt to your new circumstances and eventually return back to how you were before. So what does this tell us about happiness though? Well, it tells us that external circumstances and life events such as these, they only make up 10% of our overall happiness, or at least what determines it. So that includes wealth and winning the lottery, your attractiveness, as well as bad things that could happen to you as well. But advertisements, commercials, they'll make you believe differently. And I'm sure you believe so differently as well. But in reality, it only makes up one-tenth of our overall happiness. So what makes up the other sections? Well, the biggest section is actually your genetic set point. That's your DNA. That's evolutionary psychology. And it's probably the reason why you made decisions and afterwards thought, why in the world did I just do that? So it's what I like to call the my brain made me do it section. And it covers, like I said, evolutionary psychology and genetics. And it's important to cover this because there are aspects that are embedded into our DNA and how our brain and how we act that we don't necessarily have control over, but it's important to be aware of them, such as the negativity bias and the hedonic treadmill. I'll go ahead and start with the negativity bias, and that's something we see every day, especially in newspapers. You'll see headlines all around. It always focuses on death, killing, terrorism, destruction. And the media does this on purpose. In fact, their motto is, if it bleeds, it leads, because they know that you'll pay attention to it. And that's because the negativity bias. We're naturally wired to pay more attention to the negative than the positive. That's why when your significant other makes a negative comment to you, but then makes up for it for 20 positive comments, that negative comment still sticks with you and you remember it plenty of days later. But why does this happen? Well, it's evolutionary psychology. And Dr. Rick Hansen explains this best in his quote of the number one rule that our ancestors had to go through, which was, eat lunch today, don't be lunch today. And so in other words, what this means is that our ancestors that were more likely to survive weren't the ones that were walking around saying how beautiful it is out today and how beautiful this tiger is. They were the ones who were saying, oh my God, there's a tiger, let's get away from it. And they remembered that the tiger was there. So it's very natural for you to see the negative. It's, what, it's the reason we're here today. But it's important to remember as well when you're going through day-to-day -day life and realize that sometimes you have to put a focused effort on noticing the positive and letting it sink in and not letting the negative stick with you. The other thing about evolutionary psychology that's important is known as the hedonic treadmill. And anyone with an iPhone probably knows it pretty well. It's as soon as you buy your iPhone, which you knew would bring you so much happiness because it's the new model. Well, less than a year later, there's a new version. And all of a sudden, this happiness you thought you'd get, it just isn't there anymore. You want the new version, the better version. 
And once again, you just have to look at our evolution to realize why this happens, and it's completely natural. It's because back when we were hunters and gatherers, the humans who kept on gathering more and more and were never happy with what they had, well, when natural disaster struck, they're the ones that survived, not the ones that were happy with what they had in the moment. So sure, they impede on our happiness, but you can work against them if you're aware of them. So we know that this makes up a total of 50% of your genetic set point, or your genetic set point makes up 50% of your happiness. But that leaves a huge chunk left. What makes up the last 40%, almost half of your happiness? Well, that's up to you. That is up to intentional activity that you do. And that's a huge section, almost the same as your DNA. You can control of your own happiness. But exactly how does this work? Well, Dr. Rick Hansen explains it best through the concept of neuroplasticity, which is, through his quote, neurons that fire together, wire together. What does this mean? It means you have the power to reshape your brain to become more positive. Instead of focusing on the stressors and the negatives in life, you can focus on the positives. Because when you focus on stress, it starts creating neurons firing back and forth in your brain that become pathways. They ingrain in your brain. So later on, when a similar topic comes up, your brain starts using those pathways again to remind you of all that stress and negativity. But on the opposite, if you start paying attention to the positives and letting happiness infuse your life, it'll start infusing your brain as well, and literally rewiring your brain to become happier. Now, if you don't quite believe me that you can reshape your whole brain, I think it's important to take a look at the 1959 study. Now, this study took place in 1979, and it took a group of men, and for weekends, they were put in a camp where they could only talk as if it were still 1959. They could only read books from that era. They had to pretend Eisenhower was still president. They had to literally pretend that it was 20 years earlier than it actually was. And before the camp, they took pictures of these men and did various tests, usually correlated with age, on them. Because, of course, age only works in one direction, right? Well, what they found surprised them. They found that actually, by tricking their brain and having the mindset that they were 20 years earlier, at the end of the camp, people rated their pictures as looking three years younger than the starting pictures. They also found that their eyesight improved, as well as their hand grip strength and many other meters usually associated with age, all reverse course, which wouldn't be naturally what we'd assume. And that's because the brain rewired and literally believed that it was younger and started acting that way. So what does this tell us about happiness? It means that what you pay attention to sh literally shapes your brain, and you can reshape that to your advantage. So now that you know you have such control over your brain, 40% of your own happiness, what are ways you can become happier? Well, there's plenty of them. And the first one, proposed by Dr. Aker, a Harvard happiness researcher, actually found through the Lever and Fulcrum principle that was related to the 1959 study. And the fact that there's two different aspects that you can use to leverage your happiness. The first being the lever, or the power we believe we have to make a change, or the fulcrum, which is the mindset with which we generate the power to change. The fulcrum, or the mindset, was shown in the 1959 study. But now let's explore the lever aspect, or belief, because belief has a huge impact on our overall happiness. This can be best exemplified by the placebo and nocebo effect. One great study that showed this was when they took 13 participants that were highly allergic to poison ivy and brought them into the lab. The researcher blindfolded them, started rubbing a leaf on their arm, and said, I'm rubbing poison ivy on you. Unsurprisingly, all 13 of them had severe allergic reactions to it. But the surprising part, the doctor just rubbed a regular leaf on their arm. But they believed it was poison ivy. And because of that, their body had an actual reaction to it. So what does this say about happiness? This says that you have to believe that you can become happier. You have to believe that you can get the job you've always wanted. Because if you don't believe in yourself, that's like building a wall in the front of you before a race has even started. You're putting a huge obstacle that will keep you from getting there. So really, becoming happier starts with your own belief. But of course, there are many other factors. Um, and one that they found in a longitud longitudinal study of Harvard um, graduates throughout their life found that there was one principle that stood out above the rest as being the long-term predictor of who would be happiest. And that was your social connections. And what does this mean? This means that your connections with friends, family, coworkers, um, the people that surround you, the, they found that the more people you had around you and the deeper the connections they were, the more fulfilling you felt life was, the more you enjoyed life, the happier you were. And even on top of all that, the longer you lived. 
the people without many social connections live the least out of this whole study. So this means for you, find every aspect of your life where you can increase your social connections and increase the bond you have with other people. And another huge reason why you can become happier is actually, ironically, money. Sure, we said wealth only makes up 10%, but there are ways you can use your own money to make yourself happier. The most important of them all being to buy experiences, not objects. Why is this? As we saw before with iPhones and hedonic treadmill, if you buy an item, it'll give you a lot of happiness for a short amount of time, but pretty much it'll end up in the back of your closet at one point. Whereas if you buy experiences, you're creating memories, you're creating stories, and you're deepening your social connections with other people. And this, this lasts a long time. You can always go back to your memories and restore your faith in how um, much support you have from your social network. So if you have an option to buy something with money, whether it's a camera or a concert ticket, go with the social connections through the experiences. That's not all with money, though, as we also found that if you buy early and you savor it, which means in today's world of buying with Amazon Prime and getting it within a day or less, that's actually not the way to be happiest. Because if you buy something earlier, it gives you, especially up to a week, it'll give you a week to think and savor about buying that. And surprisingly enough, when you just think and imagine and savor the, that um, purchase or that experience, it uses the same neural pathways as if you were actually experiencing it. So you're literally extending your happiness by an extra week by buying it early and giving yourself that time to daydream and savor over it. There are plenty of other ways to become happier as well, and I'll touch on a few. One is biophilia, and that's our connection with nature. One study done in a hospital of people recovering from surgery found that if they were placed in a room with just a brick wall versus if they were placed in a room that had a view of a garden and trees, the people in the room with a garden and trees view not only did they recover quicker, but they required less medication because nature has a natural healing effect on us. So the more you spend time with it, whether it's hiking, watching sunsets, or whatever you enjoy, including growing a plant, it'll actually increase your happiness over time. Another huge point is gratitude. This is important because you have to find the low-hanging fruits and work against the hedonic treadmill. This means that be thankful for the small things you have, whether it's being here at this conference rather than being stuck somewhere else, or at least having the clothes that you have on your back because not everyone else has that privilege. And while this may sound simple, it's something that our brain easily skips over. So the more we focus on it, the happier we'll be. And then an uh, important one for relationships is novelty and variety. If you find in your relationships that things are just going through cycles and the same over and over again, do something new. Go on a new date. Switch up your schedule so date night is on a different week. Because this will infuse dopamine into your brain, which is a happiness chemical, which makes you find new interest in your relationship. This goes beyond relationships too as well, as you can use variety in the way you get to work or go to class. Take a different route next time. It'll change it up and infuse a little bit more happiness in your life. Now, while these are just a few tips and ways to become happier, um, it's important to realize that, sure, some of them do seem like, isn't that common sense? But Dr. Aker has a great point. He says that common sense is not common action. So you need to choose one of these, or maybe two, and try over and over again to start infusing them into your life, because you have to make it a habit. And making it a habit takes 21 days in a row of consistently doing it, which isn't easy. But if you do that, you will constantly be infusing your life with happiness and be changing your neural structures in your brain to becoming happier. So remember that 40% of your happiness is dictated by things you do every day. So remember, happiness is a choice. So make it. Thank you.